Hello and welcome to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In this video, we're going to be having a look at haemophilia, both haemophilia A and haemophilia B, how it comes about, and what we may do to treat it. Um, so in this series so far, we've covered disorders of primary hemostasis, and in this video, we will not only be looking at secondary hemostatic disorders, but also finishing on some SBAs as well, just to really help us uh, solidify our understanding. So with that said, let's get into haemophilia. What does haemophilia refer to? Well, we know that hemo refers to blood and philia refers to a likeness towards or a tendency towards. So in haemophilia, there's a tendency towards bleeding and patients tend to bleed quite often. And this is often a genetic condition in most cases. It's a congenital condition, meaning it's present from birth. However, in up to 30% of cases, there may be a no genetic link whatsoever. And this type of genetic condition is one uh, that occurs in the X chromosome and thus it's X linked. So let's start with what happens. Here we can see we have the X and Y chromosome. Now, if we just take a look at it, we can automatically see that the X chromosome is significantly longer than the Y chromosome. Now, this is actually very interesting because it allows for a dynamic that we're about to see being set up. And that dynamic is that the X chromosome is actually able to bend around itself, unlike the Y chromosome, putting these two very special regions next to each other. Now, it's in this region that we find the factor eight and factor nine genes, the two factors that are actually deficient in haemophilia A and B. And because the X chromosome has bent around itself, genes can start to cross over and switch over. And therefore we get disruption to, or messing up of, of our uh, factor eight and factor nine gene, meaning that we end up producing reduced amounts or not at all of factor eight and factor nine. So haemophilia therefore is a deficiency of either factor eight in haemophilia A or factor nine in haemophilia B. And usually fa uh, factor eight deficiency is significantly more common. And also this occurs as we saw was due to a what we call a flip tip inversion where the X chromosome crosses around itself leading to this X linked recessive condition. So what does what's the consequence of not having enough factor 8 and factor 9? Well we know that factor 8 and factor 9 take place in the clotting cascade to help stabilize our platelet plug and help form fibrin, right? And we know that looking at the clotting cascade, that they uh, take part specifically in the intrinsic pathway, where in the very last step of the pathway, factor eight and factor nine together help to go on to activate factor 10 into factor 10A. If therefore we have a deficiency of either factor eight or factor nine, we can see that we're halting the intrinsic pathway. And therefore we're not able to he uh, help produce fibrin. So we can't help produce our fibrin sheath or help stabilize our clot. So what kind of symptoms is this going to lead to? Well, the first one's not really a symptom, it's more of the demographic. And because it's an X-linked condition, this tends to often be seen, the congenital form that is, in males. The non-congenital form or acquired forms of haemophilia can be seen in both males and females, and is often due to things like uh, exposure to radiation. Okay, so that's the first uh, demographic. The first symptom that we might see, especially in um, infants, is that they tend to bleed a lot more or uh, take a lot longer to stop bleeding during their heel prick test. A test that helps us to rule out some very, very important conditions from birth, one of them being things like sickle cell anemia. Continuing on with this, we might get things like as the child is growing up, if they have minimal trauma, like falling over, they may bleed into their muscles. As well as that, if they fall on their joints, they may bleed into their joints. And this is a really big problem in a poorly controlled haemophilia, is that haemophiliacs tend to get really bad um, joint disorders and really, really bad arthritis as they get older because of the recurrent bleeds into their joints. And lastly, they may have extensive and large bruises. Now, you can see how this is different to that of our primary hemostasis, where we saw a petechial and a purpuric rash, which are these needle print um, points of bleeding rather than these large areas of bru uh, bleeding and bruising. And this is mainly because we can't stabilize our platelet plug. So what kind of investigations are we going to want to do? Okay, well, in any bleeding disorder, we have to always ask the question, is this an issue with primary or secondary hemostasis? So let's rule out the issue with primary hemostasis by doing some F uh, FPCs. And in our full blood count, because we have no issues with the platelets, it's going to be completely normal. 
The next thing we want to do is uh, check if our secondary hemostasis is working correctly. And we do this by doing some clotting studies. And we know in this case, because we are turning off the ex uh, intrinsic pathway, we're going to have a prolonged APTT. The next thing then we can do is actually have a look at what factors are deficient by doing a factor 8 and factor 9 assay. And usually, in most cases, since factor 8 is more common, we're going to see reduced amounts of factor 8. If we have haemophilia B, however, we might see uh, normal levels of factor 8, but a reduced level of factor 9. Another thing that we can do is if we have normal levels of both is that we can do a functionality assay. So for instance, if we had normal levels of a uh, factor eight, but our um, factor eight was dysfunctional, we'd still get the same symptoms. The next thing we want to do is make sure that there's no issue with the transport of the factors. And we know that factor eight is transported by von Willebrand's factor. So therefore we can do a von Willebrand factor assay just to ensure that our von Willebrand is also uh, behaving the way it's supposed to. And lastly, we should do some LFTs or liver function tests. And the reason for this is that our factor eight and factor nine, like quite a lot of our proteins, is actually produced in our liver. So therefore, we can do some LFTs just to make sure that our liver is not dysfunctional. So what kind of management options are there um, for hemophilia A and B? Well, first of all, if we just break it down to the very simple steps, what is it? It's a deficiency of factor 8 or factor 9. So therefore, the best thing to do would be to replace those factors within haemophilia A, things like recombinant factor 8 or something that you call octocog alpha. In the acute scenario where uh, re uh, recombinant factor 8 may not be available, we can use other means of bypassing the intrinsic pathway. So what do I mean by this? Well, look, we have blocked the intrinsic pathway. But we can still upscale the action of the extrinsic pathway to help us produce fibrin because, look, factor 7 is still helping us to go to produce um, fibrin. So one of the things that we can do is give activated factor 7A concentrate just to help us build more fibrin. Should this not be available, we can give something like an antifibrinolytic, meaning whatever clot that we do have is not broken down as easily by giving tran tranexamic acid. And we can help to force more factor 8 from our endothelial cells directly into circulation with the giving of desmopressin. Should this still not work, another thing that we can do is give something like cryoprecipitate. Now, cryoprecipitate is a blood product that contains quite a lot of things, um, but one of the things that it actually contains is factor 8 and von Willebrand factor. So we can give cryoprecipitate just to replace some of the factor 8 levels. And if that doesn't work, and this is still done in much more um, poorer countries where things like uh, cryoprecipitate or factor 8 uh, A concentrate might not be available, is give something like fresh frozen plasma, because this contains all of the clotting factors in our plasma. And we will talk about uh, all of the clotting factors and all of these blood products in a separate video. That concludes the video. I hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one.